welcome to the second Saturday. This is the last one of 2018, and uh, we're very pleased to have uh, a, a very special for, uh, guest of ours and a good friend of mine. And um, but before we do that, I know a lot of you. I see a lot of familiar faces. Who's who's been here for the first time? Who's who's never been here for a second Saturday before? Oh wow! Okay, so we do have some. Good. Well, welcome. And we have them every Saturday, starting in January through uh, April, and then we'll start up again in September next year. We're taking the summer off because of all the things that are going on in the summertime. So, but without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Tom Tabor. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, my pleasure uh, being here and uh, giving everybody a little bit of uh, uh, insight on our store. Um, Obviously, I'm Tom Tabor, uh, number four generation in our business, um, working with my sister, which is kind of an amazing thing. I was telling you to somebody <laughs> earlier, uh, if you had told me when I was 10 or 12 years old that I was going to be working with my sister, I would have probably hit you, because uh, my sister and I fought you know, all, all the time. We were arguing about everything. I'm a car guy, so I love cars, and one day I had built this model and uh, I came home and we had a two-story house and my sister was at the top of the steps. Sharon, you can tell her this, this is true. Um, and she was holding my prized possession car that I had just built. And she said, Tommy, isn't this your new car that you built? And I said, yes. And, and she, she was kind of pretending like she was gonna drop it. And I ran up the stairs and we had a little fight and the car went down the stairs. And just as that happened, my dad came around the corner and saw that, and he was furious with me because I just put this, he paid for this model that I apparently wrecked. And he said, Tom, go up to your bedroom and go to, you know, no dinner for you. And my sister didn't come to my rescue. Um, well, she had dinner, and it was after, uh, after dinner, she said, oh, mom and dad, you know, Tom didn't drop that model. We had a fight, and it was my fault. So then they felt terrible about it. And mom came up to, or dad came up to my bedroom, would open the door, and I was sound asleep. So I guess I wasn't that bad. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, as I said, Barb and I are number four generation. Um, I've been at the store. I'm, we're kind of the new kids on the block. I've been there for 39 years, and my sister has been there for 40. Um, and we do different things, obviously. Uh, I, I do a lot of the diamond buying and watches and things like that, and my sister does I think, in my opinion, the bigger job, and that's all the gift things that you see in the store, uh, which is, a, is an, a, a monumental task to go to market, which she, she and my niece Christine, her daughter, go twice a year uh, to Atlanta, and it's enormous. It's this, people think it's a vacation, but you literally go into a room, a showroom, maybe this size or half the size, and you look at different products, and then you make notations, yes, I'm gonna buy that, then they have to discuss how many they need to buy, how many they think they're going to sell. It was funny, years ago, when it was in Chicago, I went with Barb and uh, Mom uh, for the first time. And of course, back then, you know, women wore skirts and dresses and high heel shoes and thought nothing of it. And I had my suit on and comfortable shoes, and I was exhausted at the end of the day. I was a lightweight. They weren't too happy with having I, They were happy to have me, but I, I was kind of a complainer, which men do now and then, shocking. <laughs> Uh, but it was quite the, uh, quite the eye-opening experience to see, you know, what goes into stocking our store, uh, which is uh, uh, everyday occurrence now. But um, so going back a little bit in our business, uh, Herman Hiss was my great grandfather. Uh, he started the business, um, or actually changed it. Uh, he was a watchmaker first, uh, and he worked for John Rose. So it was the John Rose Diamond Company. Uh, and then Herman uh, had decided well, along with him, or John decided that he wanted to sell the business. So Herman uh, had a wealthy aunt, as the story goes, uh, that decided to give him the loan, loan him the money to buy the building, or buy the business. Um, and she said, the only requirement that I have is that you name it, I don't want my name on the business, but name it Herman Hiss and Company. People always wonder, or have asked us over the years, what does the company stand, come from? Well, that was his aunt who had the wherewithal to give him the money to, uh, to buy the business. So he bought the business and changed it, obviously, to Herman Hiss and Company. 
And back in the day when you were a jeweler, you were oftentimes an optometrist, which grandpa, great grandpa was an optometrist. And we had equipment, uh, optical equipment and eye testing equipment that was really amazing um, that they used for all these years. So he did both, uh, both things, uh, but watchmaking was his real passion. <laughs> Uh, so obviously, you know, starting off this business, um, you know, was a challenge, uh, and especially later in the, well, back up our first location. For those who don't know, was actually where the Mill End store, the Mill End lofts, now those apartments. Um, and you can look at these pictures afterwards. But this is a picture of our first location uh, at the Mill End uh, store. Store was. And this little gentleman that was standing in the front uh, was my grandpa Florian Hiss, Herman's son. Uh, that was sometime in the late, uh, late 1800s. But. So anyway, Grandpa Herman uh, obviously was a jeweler and a, an optometrist and a watchmaker. Uh, and that was his real passion. Uh, later on, uh, my grandfather Florian, his son, uh, came into the business and uh, Grandpa had obviously taken it over. The second generation uh, was working on different things. And, and Grandpa knew, I think, in addition to jewelry, that you had to have china and crystal, the things that we used to sell an awful lot years ago. So they expanded that. Uh, and then they ended up wanting to go to a larger location. So they moved uh, on Washington Street. I didn't bring a picture of that, but it used to be the Sweet Boutique uh, on Washington, kind of next to Neps there. Uh, that was the second location. Uh, and they were there for a number of years and then realized that they outgrew that space. Um, so then they decided to embark on building a brand new store, uh, which the construction of the new store was going on in 1929, which as we all know was not a very good time, you know, the Great Depression. Uh, I don't know how, you know, mom and dad told us over the years that were very lean years uh, when they started, you know, uh, they had, uh, my grandfather Florian was working as a young man. Herman was there. Uh, they had uh, Herman's wife, uh, Sarah, and another person who was a bookkeeper, and that was it. And uh, apparently, as the story goes, they didn't, they couldn't afford to, you know, pay anyone. So the bookkeeper was working for free uh, for a while, and then, uh, as the story continues to go along. Uh, there was a gentleman that came in who bought a very nice diamond ring that year, and things were terrible. And they had this beautiful building and a lot of you know debt to the bank. Um, and uh, this gentleman bought a ring, and I think it was about a $500 ring, which back then would have probably been about $10,000 today. And the money that they made from selling that one ring helped them to get through several months, um, and then things eventually obviously got a little bit better uh, and away they went. But, and Herman passed away, uh, never knew him, but he passed away in 1937 and my grandfather Florian uh, was in firm control. And Grandpa Hiss, I don't know if some of you may remember him, he was quite an interesting fellow uh, and uh, I often think that uh, he maybe missed his calling as much as he loved the jewelry business, he loved finance. and. I think if he maybe had it to do over again, he probably would have been a financial advisor because Grandpa loved the stock market. I don't know if, it, if the stock, when the depression happened, if that spurred him on to you know, be more into it, but boy, he really enjoyed the stock market. The diamond business was still his number one you know, priority, but that was a big, uh, a big thing for him. And we used to have a roll top desk in the front of the store in our present location that I remember vaguely because uh, it seemed like it was enormous. Um, and Grandpa had all of his stocks and papers and things, so he'd wait on customers. But he also, uh, you know, liked to dabble in the in the uh, in the stock market. <coughs> there was another interesting story too, going back to Herman, which kind of I don't know. It's in our DNA with our customers how we treat everyone. But Herman was working on a watch, and watch repairs are very delicate, intricate, you know, not easy to do, and and you really have to concentrate. And in the front office, if you come in our store to the right, um, was where we used to do a lot of the watch repairs. And Herman was doing those, obviously, in the early 30s. And he was working on a pocket watch, and there's a thing called the hairspring, which has, it regulates the time. And just as he was getting ready to put the hairspring in, one of our employees said, Mr. Hiss, there's a customer for you. And the hairspring slipped, and he said, damn it. 
he was really upset. Uh, while the customer was just a few feet away from him, and the customer, the customer thought that Herman was talking about him. And uh, boy, as, as the story goes, Herman had to really you know, apologize, and he said, no, 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 I wasn't saying it to you. I was, you know, and, and uh, so, and he was, he was pretty focused doing the pocket watches. That was the last pocket watch that he ever repaired. And then he had someone else do it, and then he realized that he needed to be on the floor. Um, and, uh, and I think about that on the floor. Going to my grandpa, Florian, he used to uh, tell all of our employees, watch the front. You know, watch the front, meaning watch the floor, greet your customers. Um, and uh, many of you who know our store know that's the way we operate. Uh, that, that's not phony. Uh, it's something that, you know, we really enjoy all of our customers and we think of them as friends. And, you know, that was Grandpa's main thinking. So obviously, when my parents came along after college and after the war, well, my mother was working in the store. That's when she started, my mother Sally. Um, and uh, started dating this guy, Tom Tabor, and Dad wanted to be a funeral director. He, did, he wasn't really eyeing up the jewelry business, and fortunately, I guess it's fortunate, I'm glad I'm in the, fu in the jewelry business and not the funeral business. <laughs> nothing, nothing bad against that, but I like working with diamonds instead of the other alternative. <laughs> but I think Dad was the one who arranged the first date for Mom, and uh, or my, my Grandpa Florian was the one who arranged the first date. And then he said, you know, Tom, this is a very good business. You should work in the jewelry store. And Dad, you know, wasn't real sure about that. After, as I said, after World War II, uh, he was at Northwestern and graduated and had a business and finance degree. And Dad had other ideas, as I said, maybe being a funeral director. And Grandpa kind of twisted his arm. And obviously, uh, 40 some years, 48 years later, uh, the, the store kept going with mom and dad. Um, so interesting that obviously they worked together as a husband and wife, and as I was joking about working with my sister, um, you know, mom and dad did it for all those years, and I had several people, we've had people over the years that assumed that Barb and I were husband and wife, and not brother and sister. And, uh, and of course, you never want to correct a customer when they say, gee, you know, you're, they'd see us on TV and they'd say, Tom, your wife does such a good job on those TV commercials. And for the first kind of one, I went, mm, well, I'm not going to say anything. Um, and I said to my sister, people think that we're husband and wife. And we did correct a few people and they were kind of surprised. But that Christmas, it happened in the fall, that Christmas, I said to Barb, we've got to do a commercial and we have to explain things. So I started off my commercial saying, my sister and I invite you to come to Herman Hiss this Christmas season. And then Barb did the same thing. It was incredible, the number of customers that came in and said, we didn't know that you were a brother and sister. We thought you were a husband and wife. And I said, well, I know it is amazing that we work together and, and uh, get along so well. But anyway, uh, interesting, obviously, with mom and dad, uh, my mother, uh, was really a pioneer at her time of uh, being a strong businesswoman. She, uh, she really knew what it would take uh, and worked so hard every day. And uh, I, I think today we finally have women that are getting into more important roles and being equal. But back in the days with mom and dad, you know, the woman's place was at home and the man did everything, you know, typical men fashion or thinking. And mom was really ahead of her time, uh, and she, she discovered trends and discovered gift things that we wanted to have in the store, you know, the china and the crystal that used to be a big thing when young couples got engaged. Everybody got china and crystal. Now today, they want, you know, other things, and they register at, you know, Home Depot or who knows where because they want more practical things. We still sell nice things, obviously, that they like, but it's changed a little bit. But Mom was really ahead of her time, as I said, um, knowing about these things. And she was the one who really realized that we needed to expand, which is what we did in 1987. And that's this picture right here. Um, my wife and uh, mom and dad and my sister, we were going over the plans. We've joked, and I was telling someone today, that we had the world's most expensive parking lot, because uh, that's where we used to park our cars, next to the jewelry store. And mom realized, you know, that that was a waste of space. You know, that's prime real estate downtown. We should have a, we should have another building there. 
And uh, I think Grandpa Hiss wanted to do it too, but he was kind of a cheapy penny pitcher, <laughs> and he didn't want to spend the money. Uh, but Mom, Mom realized that you know Barb and I were working in the store uh, for almost 10 years at that time, and she knew the future of the store was going to be with us, and wanted us to have you know really a better, larger area to work with. Um, and at the time. When we built that addition in 1987, it was $250,000, which was a lot of money to spend um, on this little parking lot that we had. And we, you know, Dad kind of joked about it and said, "Well, we're going to lose our parking spaces." You know, I like that parking space, uh, but you know, obviously, it was um, much better to have the new building. And then going to the jewelry show or the gift shows, like Barb uh, and Mom did, uh, there were so many lines that they wanted to carry, but they didn't have the space. With the new uh, side, it opened up this whole area that really uh, made it much better for us. And as you know, when you come in the store, we have many more lines. Uh, and Mom also realized that with the gift things are up on the, sec on the balcony, the second floor, a lot of our older customers didn't want to walk up the steps or people that had issues with their legs or back couldn't go up the stairs. So Mom realized then, you know, people are missing out on things that we have to sell. Uh, and that was another reason why we wanted to do the new, uh, the new side. But, and our, I remember our CPA at the time uh, talking to us and saying, boy, you're going to spend $250,000. And it was actually more than that when you consider uh, that two fifty dollars didn't include a lot of things that we had to do. So it was closer to about three fifty. dollars And he said, you're going to spend all of that money on the gift items that you don't those are not high ticket items. Those are five dollar, ten, twenty-five, and my mother persevered and said, "No, you know this is going to make our entire business better." Uh, and she was right. You know we have so many customers now that come in that still buy diamonds and things, of course, but they make a beeline for that gift side, and it's been a huge draw uh, for new customers and existing customers to go in. Uh, so again, as I said, it was uh, an interesting. Uh, uh, progression for mom to know and to realize that that was the next step in our business. Um, so now obviously we look at my sister and I are working in the store after college. Uh, I just knew that this is what I wanted to do. I started in the basement, which you know the old joke about starting as a janitor or whatever and working your way up to the top. I'm the president now. Um, and uh, But I started in the basement making bows, boxes, Doing janitorial work, which you know, I, and I still do an awful lot of it today because that store is my baby. I have two sons, and I consider the store as another child uh, that needs to be taken care of daily. Uh, you know, there are always things that happen, so I've been kind of passing that on to my uh, niece and nephew. But anyway, my sister and I uh, worked very closely with my parents after school or after college, and working in the store um, and backing up too. My sister went to Northwestern University in Chicago and worked at Northern Trust Bank. That She was in the banking industry. She had no interest in coming to the store. Amazing how things work. I'm a firm believer that the big guy upstairs has a plan for all of us and you know it all happens in the way it's supposed to be. And Barb was in Evanston for two years and didn't like it and she was talking to mom and dad and mom said, well, Barb, why don't you come back? Why don't you come and work in the store. She did as a young girl, uh, just like I did when I was younger. And Barb was thinking, as so many people say, well, I don't want to come back to Bay City. What's in Bay City, Michigan? You know, after being in Chicago, she's thinking, this is everything. And why do I want to come back to little old Bay City? Well, she was here for a short time and realized that this is where she needed to be. And uh, it was the same thing for me. Although, you know, as I mentioned, I love cars, um, you know, I think if I had applied myself a little bit more, uh, maybe been an engineer, I, my dream, I think about, I would love to work for General Motors, you know, designing and building cars. Um, well, that wasn't the dream. I mean, it might have been a dream, uh, kind of jokingly, but I knew early on that I wanted to be in the store. And uh, actually, I had a good customer from Grand Blanc whose husband was a very high up executive at General Motors. and. Uh, I just happened to answer the phone one day, and it was Marilyn, and she was looking for a nice diamond ring. So I helped her, and you know, they're from Grand Blanc. She could have gone anywhere to buy a diamond, but she chose us that day to call, 
and I happened to get the phone and uh, long story shorter, she bought a beautiful diamond and she's a dear friend of mine now, which is the main thing that gets me up in the morning every day still uh, is that you know I have projects that I'm working on with our customers, but the customers are more than just that. You know, they're our friends. And, but we had some conversation and I said, Marilyn, you know, I kind of think that I miss my calling. I love cars and you know, I talked to her husband, Vince, and he invited me to uh, Troy to this big meeting with uh, General Motors engineers and I had taken my dad with, them, with me. And we were like two kids in a candy store. We just had a blast and meeting all these people. And I said to Marilyn afterwards, you know, I wish I would have studied more. I wish I would have been an engineer. And she said, Tom, you're doing the right thing. You know, we would have never met if you were an engineer somewhere. And, mm -hmm. and she said, if you want to go back to school and become an engineer, you can. And I said, no, 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 no. That's, you know, <laughs> I'll play with the old cars. I have my dad's old cars. But so, you know, customers obviously are the most important thing to us uh, in relationships. And I think about them, those two, as being dear friends uh, that I'll have forever. Uh, that, you know, yes, it's fun to sell things. And uh, you know, we've earned a nice living over the years, and we have lots of great things. But we get to know people uh, and know people's stories. Uh, they trust and depend upon us, which is a huge responsibility. I know that we don't take lightly, uh, but it's something that obviously we enjoy to do. Um, you know, and as I said, obviously Barb and I kind of evolved a little bit. We had the new business or the new building. Uh, that has been tremendous. Uh, but we look at trends uh, that we have in our store today that I think if Grandpa Hiss could come back for a day and see what we have in our store, he would say, now what are these baby clothes? <laughs> or, you know, what is this? How, why are we selling this? Or why are you selling ladies' clothes? You know, uh, these are all things that, you know, we've had to evolve over the years. Diamonds, uh, Dad always said, don't ever forget that diamonds are what you know brought us to the whole to the show, um, and we work real hard on that, and have I think the best diamonds and great prices, and uh, you know that's really the most important thing. But I think about all the uh, uh, experiences that we've had, I've had with customers. Just yesterday, a young man picked up a diamond ring that I helped him with, and you know we looked at loose diamonds, you know unmounted. He picked out the setting. Uh, and it's, it's fun for me, it's scary. I've been told from a lot of these young gentlemen that are like, geez, I'm nervous. And I always tell them that don't be nervous about you know, buying the diamond ring. The nervous part comes when you have to ask her husband or her father <laughs> that, you know, if it's okay to have her hand. You know, that kind of lighten, lightens the uh, mood a little bit. But I think of yesterday, his name is Rick. Um, he thanked me over and over. And I said, Rick, wait a minute, thank you. You know, I appreciate you letting me be a part of this, uh, you know, in a small way. And he said, well, I just think it's great, and she's going to love it. And, and I said, well, when you get engaged, I want to meet her. You know, please come in. And, you know, that's, that's all part of it, you know, for us, uh, that we have fun and enjoying it. Um, another cute story, I've got many, we could, I could keep you here all day, but a cute story that happened just this year. Uh, as I said, I've been there for 39 years and never experienced this, but we had a nice couple. Uh, he's blind, uh, or she's blind, um, and they came in together looking at rings, and she kind of knew what she wanted and just by feel. Um, so they kind of, she more or less told him that was fine, and then he came back on his own and selected the diamonds, we put it all together. So we called him, actually the sales gal who was helping him, Brianna, called and said, you know, the ring is ready, and he said, okay, I'll be in to pick it up. Well, they came in together, and Bree was a little bit nervous because they were together, and she thought, well, he's going to pick up the ring, and how is that going to work and everything, and so anyway, he said, you know, uh, kind of pulled her to, a si to the side and said, I want to pick up the ring today, and Bree thought, well, but she's with you, and he said, don't worry. He was very calm about it, and Next thing we know, the two of them are up at the front of the store. He gets down on his knee oh, no. and gets the, after he got bought the ring, and proposes right in our store, right in the, right in the front. I said, okay, I can, I can retire right now. I think I've seen everything. Everybody was crying. Oh. Uh, it, it was really, 
one of those, and I've had so many special moments, but it was a really special moment for me. Uh, and I know Dad had countless uh, uh, experiences. The closest that he came uh, to that same thing happening is a couple got married, and in the uh, you know in the limousine or whatever, they stopped at the jewelry store, and the wedding party came in. Uh, they, 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 she was in her beautiful dress, and here were all the people and wanted to show off, you know, that they got married, and so Dad got to enjoy that, which was pretty cool, but I kind of had a one-up on him with this <laughs> one. But it's been, a, it's been an amazing business. As I said, uh, looking at some of these pictures, uh, you can kind of get a little bit of a feel about where we, where we started, um, you know, and I think we had our 150th anniversary last year, so this is our 151, 151 this year. Uh, it's amazing uh, that the business has survived. You know, you think about businesses today, um, and the statistics are to go from the third generation to the fourth generation, 3%, I think, of uh, businesses make it. Um, and actually, it's a, it's a small percentage going from the second to the third generation. So third to fourth would have been mom, to, mom and dad to Barb and I. Um, and now, you know, in our fifth generation, my sister's daughter, Christine, and her husband, Nick, are number five, and they've been at the store for 10 years. Uh, I don't even know what the percentages could be for that. It has to be extremely small, smaller than 3%, uh, going from a fourth generation to a fifth generation. And I've told them, you know, they're like sponges. They're in their late 30s, but they, they've been learning and just like we did. Um, I said, don't ever forget the basic formula that has made us a success, and that is to be honest and friendly um, and have fun with the customers, because uh, people appreciate that. And now today, more than ever, and we all know when you go to a business, there aren't many stores left uh, that you can, number one, talk to someone who knows what they're talking about, or they care. Uh, we were in Florida visiting our son for a week, and. We had some time to kill during the day and went shopping and uh, you know I was being a good husband with my wife you know yes dear <laughs> as we were looking through clothes and and it was kind of strange I ended up buying new shoes and a couple pairs of pants so I worked out pretty good but it was like pulling teeth to get somebody to help us um, and then we I did find someone and I had some questions and they didn't they were of no help you know and, I don't know if I'm just a little jaded because of our business and the way our customers ex expect to be treated and our employees do it, um, but today it's really a lost art and that's what's, I think, so important for us and my niece uh, and nephew, Nick and Christine, get it, they understand it and uh, you know that's a basic philosophy. You can build a successful business on some very simple things and people have asked us, you know, well how have you how you survived all these years. And I think, well, you know, it's, a, it's good, good training. Number one, Herman gave Florian good training. Florian gave my mother a very good training and also almost to a, a fault. You know, Grandpa was a real taskmaster. And uh, I remember Mrs. Piper, uh, your mom, one of our, our longtime uh, sales, staff, sales uh, uh, persons, um, Grandpa probably drove her crazy. Um, but it was all because he knew how important the customer was, and that was really the, what mattered at the end of the day. And uh, I think, I don't know if it was your mom or not, but was it your mom or maybe Mrs. Meyer, but my grandpa Hiss was wait, or they were waiting on a diamond customer. And grandpa was busy walking around, and he noticed that one of the women were helping this man for a diamond ring, and he thought, nope. That's not going to happen. So he came over and he said, excuse me, uh, I'm going to get one of the good help to take care of you. <laughs> right, right in front, and it could have been your mother, um, right in front of our sales gal. And uh, obviously she wasn't too happy about it, but, and the customer was embarrassed. But what Grandpa's point was, I think he was looking for my dad, who was more knowledgeable in diamonds, although Mrs. Piper knew her stuff on diamonds. Uh, but Grandpa knew boy, we got to have the best person to help this, so let me get one of the good help. And I've, <laughs> I've, I've told that story to some of our customers, and they say, your grandfather said that? And I said, yes, it's, it's, tr it's true. But uh, as I said, it's been an interesting uh, 
a wonderful business. Um, I've been there, as I mentioned, for 39 years. Um, kind of looking now that Nick and Christine are there, the fifth generation uh, starting to slow down a little bit. My sister and I are both kind of taking a little bit more time. We're still there to help and guide because there are still things that you know need to be passed on and understood. And uh, Christine said to me the other day, Uncle Tom, you know, you're just you just know everything about this building. And I said, Well, it's been here for I've been here for a long time, so I've learned, and you will learn too. They they know a lot as it is. But I said that's what I'm here as, and I'm not I'm not going anywhere. But eventually, I'm going to start to fade away. Um, and I'm trying to do it like my father did and my, my mother. My mom kind of stayed a little bit longer, but all of a sudden, at age 61, I just realized that my dad was not in the store anymore. And they would go to Florida for a few months, and, uh, and there was not a definitive day that dad said, Tom, this is it. You, you are taking over for me. Um, but he did it in such a way that he helped me, trained me, gave me confidence that when that day came, I looked around and I thought, oh, wow, where's dad? He's, he's in Florida, you know. And so my mother, mom was a little bit slower to do that, uh, but did the same thing with my sister. And that's kind of where we're going, you know, with, the, as I call them, the kids. They don't like to be called kids, Nick and Christine, but that's what we call them. Um, you know, that we're around, but eventually, you know, it's time for you to grow and time for you to, you know, make a, make a go of it in the store. And, I think if my parents had stayed around for so long afterwards, they, it would have been more difficult. Um, and another cute story that dad knew when it was time for him to retire or to move on. Um, he came in the jewelry store, or a customer came in the store, and dad approached him. And the person said, hi, we're, we're here to see Tom Tabor. And dad said, well, I'm Tom Tabor. And they got a real worried, worried look on their face. And uh, they were looking around, and while well, they saw me in the back of the store, no, we want to see him. Yep. And uh, Dad said, well, that's my son, who's also Tom Tabor. Oh, OK. And so you know, Dad came back and said, there's a customer to see you. They, want to see, they wanted to see Tom Tabor, not me. And uh, so I kind of thought, oh, OK, that was a little pat on the back. Um, and that was a turning point. I think that Dad realized that his training and uh, nurturing uh, had come to fruition because these people wanted to see me. And I realized that after I did, um, I did all my GEM training, the GIA, Gemological Institute of America, and boy, I graduated and I knew all my stuff on everything. And uh, customers would come in and they would still want to see Dad. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I know everything about diamonds and I know I'm I'm you know like a hot shot I know all this stuff and dad said you have to put your time in son uh, for the customers you know, eventually the, eventually they will want to see you well then a few years after that it happened but um, uh, as I said it's it's been a wonderful business that we've enjoyed in uh, being part of the community I know it was important to mom and dad uh, it's important to my wife and I and my sister and I that Bay City uh, is a great place. It's a great place for us to live uh, and, and work in our, our business that we really enjoy, uh, but support the communities and support all the communities around our area. Uh, that's, that's part of it. So we've made our living here, but Bay City is where, uh, where, we, where we have been. And I think about Dad making a comment uh, that he was in Rotary like I am, and he was on the Downtown Development Authority and all the other boards, and he used to tell people, that he had met for the first time that were from out of town. He said, Bay City, the center of my known, or center of the known universe. Because he said, this is the impo most important area to us, and it should be to you also. But Dad kind of joked about that, that Bay City, the center of the known universe. Um, <laughs> and I'm happy to think, or happy to look at all the uh, new developments and things that are, are going on in our area, not just in Bay City, but in Midland and Saginaw. Uh, as the younger generations are coming up, uh, that there will be areas and things for them to do and live and work and play. Um, and this is a pretty amazing area. You know, we, we tend to get a little bit comfortable, um, and I have that sometimes with the store. You know, I'm, I'm used to it. And customers will tell me, you know, gosh, it's so beautiful, and it's a wonderful, wonderful building, and 
and I kind of have to kind of snap out of it and say, you know what, this really is an amazing uh, business. Uh, and I do the same thing for our community and think, you know, the naysayers and the negative people will say, oh, this is bad and that's bad. But we look at our area and think, you know what, there's an awful lot of good things that are going on. And uh, I think Bay City has a, has a good, strong future. So as I start to slow down and retire a little bit, I'm not going to disappear completely. I'll, have to, I'll be kind of in the wings, but I'll still have my hand on something, uh, and I'll be there you know, for advice, just like Dad and Mom were. Um, I remember after they had both retired, uh, they were in Florida. Mom would come home at Christmas time. Dad, on the one hand, was done. He, would, he had friends to talk to and go to get coffee and work with his cars or play with the old cars, mom would come to the jewelry store and she wanted to do something. She was a worker, obviously, always has been, and she would come to the store and Barb would say, well, there are some orders that you could call, call companies, which is a big part of it, you know, restocking, and mom said, great, I'll do that. Well, Barb said, oh my gosh, Barb came to me and she said, mom is on the phone with one of our companies and she's really mad. And I said, what's going on? Well, she was placing an order and I don't know what it was that they told my mother, but mom was not having any part of it. And she was really giving it to this person on the other, other line. My sister, after she hung up, Barb said, Mom, you know, what was going on? Well, you know, they told me that I couldn't have this, and I knew we could have it because we've had it for years. And, and uh, so Barb was a little concerned that maybe this company was, you know, going to be angry. But mom said, the heck with that. We're the, we're the customer. We're buying this product from these companies, and they need to take care of us. And she was right. So she did that for a number of years and, and still was part of the store, but after a while realized that you know, she had, she had uh, done her part, and it was time to move on. But she, she always loved the store. And when we'd go to visit them in Florida, mom would get, um, I can't think of the magazine, maybe Town & Country. It was a beautiful magazine. It had beautiful jewelry in it. And mom would show us in the magazine, boy, have you ever thought about having this? Or when we were home, she would cut out articles that she'd read in these magazines uh, and send them to Barb and I. Now, you kids, she used to call us the kids, <laughs> you kids need to read up on this and know because this could be a new trend. You know, so here was our mom. Mom passed away when she was 87, but I would say probably even into her early 80s, she was very connected to the store. Um, uh, as we obviously will be too. I look back and think about that and think, okay, I'm never going to retire because I'm still going to be interested and I'll be saying to Nick and Christine, uh, well, you guys should probably consider doing this or that. And, uh, who knows what will happen. But you know, I have two sons, both of which are not in the business. Our one son is more interested in the golf world uh, and our other son is in Florida, who that's who we were visiting, who works for Merrill Lynch. So he's our financial advisor. So I said, well, make sure you make our money grow and so mom and I can use it when we retire. <laughs> and then if you do a good job, when we die, then you'll have what's left over. So that's your incentive. <laughs> that's your incentive to invest wisely. And so far, knock on wood, he's done a pretty good job. But, but we like to go see him in Florida because it's warmer than our little, our little Michigan. That's the only problem with Bay City, that it gets cold. But I, I don't think I could take the heat all that time uh, either. But, uh, um, I'd be, you know, welcome to answer any questions if anybody has any questions that they'd like to know. Sure. With your eyes and no instruments, mm -hmm. can you tell the difference between the real thing and an imitation? Uh, the honest answer is no. Um, uh, the, the simulated stones, uh, and actually there's cubic zirconia, which is really inexpensive. Uh, good cubic zirconia even is very hard to tell. Uh, I have a loop, obviously, that I use, a magnifying loop, and then we have our microscopes. Um, but you really need to have a help of a machine to, to be able to tell, because uh, they're, to the naked eye, they're really good. And now they're actually, they've been growing diamonds for years, uh, but it's gotten to be more economical, uh, and they're actually producing, they, they take bits of carbon and do what Mother Nature did with pressure and temperature, and they literally grow diamond crystals, um, so they're called lab-grown diamonds. Uh, and they're about 20% less expensive right now than the natural diamonds. Uh, and we actually have a few. They look, they're, they, people say, well, how do they look? Well, they are a diamond. They are actual diamond. 
chemically, physically, optically, all the same. Um, but uh, you know, they're they're labeled on the girdle or the edge of the stone. They have a, a trademark, so a jeweler would know that this is a lab-grown diamond. Otherwise, you'd have no idea. Uh, I think there are some tests that the GIA can still do to differentiate. Um, so we started. This started coming into uh, the spotlight, and I thought, boy, you know, nobody's going to want to buy a real diamond anymore. They're, I mean, not one that came out of the ground. And uh, I had a customer, and she asked me that question about, you know, diamonds. Or actually, it was a couple. And I said, well, the lab-grown diamonds are grown in a laboratory, and and uh, they're less expensive. Well, her husband or boyfriend, I think they weren't married. The boyfriend said, well, I like that idea that they're less money. <laughs> and. Uh, I saw the look on her face, and she said, you are not buying me a fake diamond. <laughs> and I thought, OK. And it's not fake, but in her mind, it's, it's, not, not, it's, not, the it's not the real thing. You know, so there, it's going to have a part in our industry. There will be more of those stones. But you know, I, I thought, OK, the real diamonds are going to be alive and well for a long time. <laughs> you do it with emeralds, too, don't you? Yes, yep, yep. Uh, lots of uh, uh, created emeralds. There's a, a company called Chatham that uh, created emeralds, uh, has for years. That, and they do it with rubies and sapphires, not so much other gems like aquamarines and things, but uh, emeralds, uh, a lot of the case, a lot of those um, are created stones, although we carry everything natural right now. But we've sold a few of the created. They're a little bit tougher, a little bit harder than the natural emeralds because real emeralds are softer and not the greatest for for wearability, but uh, for the most part, again, the naturals are going to be the best. Yeah. So a little bit more about Herman Hiss. So was he born in Bay City? He was actually born in Bay City. Um, and, and are there his family members in the area today? No, the only only ones obviously would be uh, that are left in our. Uh, the group. last name Hiss. Uh, no. No. no, not at all. No, no. Right. And uh, are there three floors to your building? Uh, we, if we consider the basement, there are, yes. Oh, okay. We have a full, under the old building, we have a complete basement. Then we have the main floor, the sales floor. And then up above, actually, we can really consider it the three and a half because we have our balcony that where the gift things used to be. And then if you go up another level, uh, that is more storage. That's where I have my engraving machines our lunchroom, uh, and more stock. Um, people are amazed, uh, although, you know, most of the time my sister is kind of embarrassed because it's, you know, it's not neat. And, I mean, it's neat and organized, but it's not clean like the main floor. It's a basement, <laughs> and she doesn't like people going down there. But people look and go, wow, you have an awful lot of things in this, in this store, in the same way upstairs. Um, and Barb, one of our, one of our gift wrapper gals, um, actually we had one who, has been very sick, which we are very sad about because she worked with us for years. So we had another gift wrapper who came to kind of help out, and Barb trained her about all these things. Well, then she got another job two weeks ago. So she left us before Christmas. And my sister was upstairs, and I heard my sister walking on the floor and, you know, not, not very happy. And she said, oh, my gosh, she said, this box shouldn't be here. And that sh who did this, you know? And everyone else was like, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I said, Barb, it wasn't me. Well, you know, again, Barb wants things where they're supposed to be and organized. And so my sister was up yesterday for a couple hours working on it. And now it's straight again. So. <laughs> Yes. So when you're talking about Christine and Nick, is that another brother, sister? Uh, they're husband and wife. Uh, so Christine is my niece. Uh, that's my sister's daughter. And uh, Nick is her husband. And they've been married for 11 years. And they've been in the store for 10 years. Um, and Christine, actually uh, backing up about her, she was going to be a teacher. She graduated from uh, Western Michigan and wanted to be a teacher. And she did some student teaching for a while and was really having a hard time finding a permanent, you know, now today she would have no problems getting in because we need teachers so badly. Um, but 11 years ago, or actually 12 years ago, I think, because she worked for two years before she and Nick got married, uh, but she couldn't find anything. So my sister very quietly said, well, you know, if you'd like to work in the jewelry store, which she had when she was younger, um, no pressure. And Christine, you know, said, OK, I'll work in the store. And that was it. After a week or two, Christine knew that this is where she wanted to be. Um, so they have, uh, just like mom and dad, and it's amazing how things 
go around in life, you know, that mom and dad obviously were a husband and wife team, and then they had Barb and I, and now we're brother and sister, and now as we start to kind of fade away, now we're getting back to the husband and wife again. And uh, people have said to me, you know, how can you work with your sister? You know, how, di how it's so difficult, or, and my wife worked after, um, before our boys were born, my wife worked in the store, and people would say, how can you work with your wife, or how can she work with you? And I said, well, that's true. Um, but we'd get home at the end of the day, and Julia would say, well, how was your day today? And we worked in the same building. Um, <laughs> you know, but she was, she was doing different things, obviously, than I was, and the same thing is true today. You know, with my sister and I, and now Nick and Christine, they're doing different things throughout the, throughout the store. They go to lunch together, obviously, and we see each other, obviously, all day long, but it is kind of ironic that we say, you know, well, what'd you do today? <laughs> yeah, it's really true. How much space did you occupy in the Milan building? Uh, the first you know, floor? Uh, it was the first floor. Um, I don't know, I don't remember. I'm sure mom and dad told us about the details from them, you know, how big it was, but it wasn't a, I think it was a fairly good size area. Um, you know, looking at this one picture here, um, it's hard to tell, but you can all take a look at it. You can kind of see tables and columns set up, and that was, it was big. I remember the mill end as a young person going in there uh, and going in the second and third floor, but it was a pretty good size area. And in this picture here, this is Herman Hiss, uh, working on watches. That was before he got mad and gave up working on the watches. And this gentleman next to him was John Rose. So this picture was obviously when John Rose and Herman were still together. Um, and on the wall is this big wall clock. If you come to our store today, that's the clock that hangs on the wall. Uh, so it never obviously was, they were all for sale, but that clock never sold. And over the years, it kind of landed in different areas, but um, for a long time, it was up on the balcony. Uh, they put it up there, and um, it was kind of away, tucked away, which is a beautiful, it's a beautiful clock. Uh, it's not working right now. I'm trying to find somebody to fix it for us. Um, but when we did the new addition, uh, Mom said that clock has got to come down from the balcony. It has to be front and center. Uh, so we found a spot right to the right there when you come in where the clock, and then you'll also notice the cash register that's there. And that cash register was from 1909. Um, and we had, to, we had a man in Bay City who actually, it was stuck. He took it, he came, it was there again, amazing how things work, but I had sold him a diamond ring and we had uh, put the cash register up for display next to the clock after we built the building in 1987. And he said, Tom, I didn't know you had one of those cash registers. He said, I restore them. And I said, Jim, that's great, you know, and he kind of tinkered with it a little bit, and he said, I'll take it, and I'll restore it for you. So I, I'm an honest person, and I'm trusting, uh, still am to this day, but I, I said, I knew him as a customer, but I didn't really know him, and I said to my sister, oh, this is great, this Jim is gonna take their cash register home, and that's what he does, he restores them, and she said, who is he? <laughs> and I said, well, he's a customer. Um, well, by, but who is he? He's taking our cash register. You know, the, and uh, so I thought, okay, what have I done? But fortunately, about a month later, Jim brought it back, and it was perfectly polished and all working. But the highest sale was $99.99. And, and there was a tape inside, uh, and there were sales for a dollar and 25 cents, and there was a sale for, I think, $12. So that would have been a big, big sale back in 1909. And there were a few coins that were left inside that were old too, that we've saved that are up on the wall. And uh, So that was 1909. We've all said, boy, I wish we knew what happened to the original cash register from you know, the 1800s, where that went. Or we would all love to know, you know, in this picture here, as I was saying, that's Herman, or Florian, my grandfather, and that's where the Mill End store was. This uh, sign, this clock, I can't imagine at some point when they moved, uh, they just got rid of it. You know, and if we had that today, oh, it would be priceless. But it says, it says hiss on it, uh, so that was our, you know, clock. But but there's so many things, you know, you have, and you think, well, we're going to move on and have some new thing today, so we don't need the old, so we just throw it away. And, but 
Yes. I've been told that people don't buy wristwatches if they want to know what time does they look at their Well, it's, it's true. You know, we, we still carry quite a few watches. We have, you know, sport watches, and I love a watch. I always will wear a watch, but you're, true, you're right. Most of the young people today have this. Uh, that they can't do anything with without studying it. Um, so you can say, oh yes, it's 149. Um, I use my phone to call people and message, uh, but I still look at my watch because I like, I like to have a watch. I'm lost, but I don't have my own. Oh yes, yes, yep. Do you have the new Fit watches? Uh, we don't sell those, okay. um, but uh, my wife wears one and my sister wears one. and. Uh, it's kind of the new thing. My, my wife has had some rapid heart issues, so it's been kind of important for her because it keeps track of you know, her heart rate. And so she, if she has an event, she can look at her watch. And we've, we've been in the emergency room before, and the doctors will say, well, how high was your heart rate? And I would say, look at your watch. And she pushes a button, and it shows history, 75 beats, and then all of a sudden it goes to 140. And it shows you what time it was, too, which is pretty amazing. So we don't, don't think we're going to sell those, but you never know. But they do make things that you can go around a Fitbit watch that are jewelry, makes it look a little bit fancier. But. Yeah. How do you learn uh, uh, how to repair watches? Uh, you know, that's, a, that's becoming a lost art today. Um, we had, had, I have to say, unfortunately, our, our watchmaker of, well, all, all the years that I can remember, uh, probably 32 years, uh, he was in the Detroit area, then he moved up to the UP to Newberry, up in God's country, as he calls it. Uh, and this year he had a stroke. And uh, long story short, he's lost the use of his left hand. And uh, so our watchmaker, unfortunately, is no longer doing it. Um, and so we're in the process now of finding, trying, and there's, there's a company in Detroit that does it that's kind of mass produced and I'm not real happy about sending them so we're still looking. But there are horology schools that you would go to and I'm sure Herman probably learned somehow from, from another person or maybe some kind of schooling to learn because uh, it's very intricate. Now the new watches today are battery powered, they have different movements, you know, the manual wind movements that we used to wind uh, are kind of a thing of the past, although there's still, there are still a few that are for sale. Um, but, well, you really need to know what you're doing to work on one of those. You I was just going to ask if you had any crimes committed. Crime, uh, you know, the knock on wood, uh, the only one that we had uh, years ago uh, this was when Grandpa Florian was still alive. Uh, it was a Friday night. We were open until 9 o'clock back in the day. And somebody smashed, put through a brick through the window. Um, and that was before we had the building on the side. So it was an alley where our cars were parked. So, and the window was destroyed. Things were, it looked like he had cleaned this right out. So Grandpa came running out of the store and Somebody was on the street and he said he ran that way. So Grandpa, which I don't know, he, would, he passed away when he was 75, so he was probably 70 when this happened. Um, he was running down the, down the alley after this guy who threw the brick. And uh, my father was there and Dad came out and yelled, Florian, Florian, stop! Because uh, Dad knew, you know, that Florian didn't have a gun, or he wasn't strong enough to. He, what would you do if you te what, what would you do if you came up with this person? <laughs> so that was, you know, it looked like, boy, this guy grabbed tons of things. But little by little, we found every piece. He didn't take anything. He threw the brick through the window, and it must have startled him so much that he took off. And there was actually one item that was missing, and we found that a few days later that the door must have been opened because there was doors inside uh, from the windows. One of those must have been open and a ring shot out from the compression and it was stuck by the little radiator that we had in the office. I thought it was gone, but you know, today we hope and pray that, uh, you know, with all the bad things that are going on that people, um, you know, respect us and um, you know, the, the smash and grabs, uh, although actually we did have a, uh, this was a few years ago, a gal who stole a watch um, and came in the store. Whenever our sales help was helping her with the watch and the next thing I knew I heard a scream 
and this girl was running out the front door. And our gal Jill said, she just stole a watch, she stole a watch. And so I, unlike my grandfather, didn't run after her. <laughs> I promptly called 911, called my police friends, and they came right over. And uh, we have cameras all throughout the store. So no matter where you are, we get a very good image of what you look like. Uh, God forbid if it's something happened. So we did a still photo of this girl as she was walking out. There's a camera that's by our front door, two cameras. Got a great image of her. And I thought, well, I'm going to put this on Facebook. Because I like, you know, Facebook is fun to see and people, you know, share things or whatever. So I put it on Facebook and I said, you know, we just had a robbery. This person stole this watch. If anyone knows anything or knows who she is, please contact the police department. I put it on Facebook 20 minutes later, 20 minutes, I get a phone call, anonymous phone call, Tom, uh, I know who it is. And I said, well, well, who is this? And he said, I can't, I'm not gonna tell you, but I know her name, and he gave me her name, and she's from Bay City. And uh, so I called the sergeant at the police station, and I said, I've got a name for you. And then it was about a half an hour later, another person called, uh, and said the same thing. It's Susie Jones or whatever her name was. Um, we had uh, in the first day 12,000 shares of people sharing it. So it went all over the you know the country. Uh, and sure enough, a week later they caught her. And she you know unfortunate sad case you know drugs. And uh, she wanted to steal that watch so she could sell it to get some money to buy some drugs. And. Uh, and the, she was in the second floor of an apartment building and the police kind of had her cornered and she jumped out of the building and broke both legs. Um, but I think, I don't know what's happened to her. Hopefully she was in the hospital long enough that they took care of her and then, you know, she'd maybe get herself clean. But it's a concern. Back in the day, uh, uh, I don't know if it was grandpa's gun or our jeweler, our bench jeweler, uh, Years, years afterwards, we were cleaning something out, and my dad opened up a drawer, and there was a 38 revolver back there. And I'm thinking, Phew. and we've always had the attitude that you know, if somebody does come in, God forbid if it happens, but if someone comes in, there's nothing in our store that's worth more than a, our lives. Um, so take what you want, get out, uh, and hopefully we'll have enough with all the video thing to be able to identify them. But get them out of the store. Uh, I'm a gun owner, but I don't carry a gun. I like to shoot, and it's fun, but people say, well, Tom, you gotta carry your gun, and uh, no, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm a pretty good shot, but under stress, I'm not gonna take that chance. Uh, and I have lots of good police friends, a lot of good buddies on the police force, including our chief, um, and they take very good care of us. You know, once in a while when the alarm goes off in the middle of the night, the police are there I used to live five minutes away, now I'm a little bit farther away, uh, but they would always beat me before and I would get there fast. I'd go down Center Avenue 50 miles an hour to get there, <laughs> you know, because it's my baby. Like I said earlier, our store, and uh, you know, it's always been a false alarm, knock on wood, but. Yes? What year did um, bridal registries fall off? Oh boy. Um, you know, when we did the new edition in 87, uh, I think that was kind of the beginning of it when it was really starting to fall off. We still had them, uh, and we do still today. We have them online, uh, and we can still come in and, you know, do it the old-fashioned way of, you know, we have the list for the brides. Um, it used to be such a big part of our business. You know, the boy, if a bride was getting engaged. Um, Ask how many people got theirs. Their jewelry, their yeah. I was one. Yep. Somebody else. <laughs> well, you know, and the and the bridal registry used to be such a big thing with the crystal in China and um, and we have our you know when we got my wife and I got married, uh, Julie picked out the china and told me what I should like, which I was a, <laughs> I, I was a, I was a good husband to be, and I said yes, I like that, and you know we get it out once in a while, and I love it. It's it's really really special. And the food tastes better on it. Um, uh, but now today, with the younger people, there are different interests. And again, it's the evolving. As our business has evolved, people have evolved and changed. And, and I don't like it always, but uh, it's just the way it is. Yes? 
So did I hear you say correctly, a watchmaker school, studied watchmaker is horologist. Hor I would have thought that Hor meant something else. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd have to go back and study that one to find out where that originated it from. But a from Latin. But H O R, I think, was time. Yeah, huh. okay. See, I learned something new. My grandfather always told me, if you don't learn something new every day, then you have your head in the sand. So learn something new. But yeah, a horologist is a watchmaker. And there's st I know there are schools that you can go to, but in our throwaway society today, most of these you know, watches are just, you know, we send it back and we carry citizen and reactor. And I know that when we send them in for repair, they just replace the part or replace a movement. There's no person who is laboring over it, trying to fix it, like our watchmaker used to do, um, and that Grandpa Herman used to do. That was an intricate thing that they knew how to do, and today it's just not, not uh, in the cards anymore. But Well, thank you.